everybody. I would just uh, want to pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment. We thank you that we are here in your presence. Father Lord, we thank you that you have this topic. And Father Lord, I ask you to yeah, speak through me. And Father, touch every, every person's heart. That every person, Father, will also understand what you want them to know. Father, we thank you for this privilege. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, um, yeah, today we are talking about sexual vices. And uh, before we jump into that, I uh, want to first address why sex is very important and why sex between husband and wife. Um, yeah, and then we are going to uh, yeah, move on with uh, yeah, why sex is restricted in yeah, between husband and wife and also uh, yeah, what kind of symbol it actually is. So what kind of symbol it expresses and what does the Bible say about it? And uh, then we are going to talk about sexual vices and then um, we are going to talk about the consequences of sexual sins and how we can guard ourselves against sexual sins. So why sex between husband and wife? Um, well, Genesis uh, 1 verse 27 says that God created the male and female after his likeness. And um, he also told Adam and Eve uh, that they should be fruitful and multiply. So multiplication, it can only happen through sex. And um, so in that way, sex uh, is very important for the multiplication. And, uh, and it also helps the husband and wife to flourish. Uh, but you also have to have in mind that there are also marriages that are childless. And uh, it's maybe because of medical conditions or maybe because of a choice that they have made. But that doesn't make those marriages the bad marriages because sex can also be done in different ways. So, and um, we must un also understand that sex is uh, a gift from God. And it is not only made for procreation. Um, sex is also something that uh, helps in the physical bonding between the husband and the wife. Um, Genesis chapter two, verse 24 states it very clearly. Um, it says that, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. So this verse clearly states that um, that the husband and the wife, they become one. And um, physical intimacy should uh, express also um, their love and also it strengthens the husband and wife. Um, yeah, um, also becoming one flesh means that they will become like-minded, one-minded. In that way, it flourishes it, each other. In that way, they become even much more fruitful. But um, sex is also something that um, is needed in marriage because of uh, consummation. You know, with sex, uh, the vows between husband and wife uh, is consummated. Um, we can gain a bit more understanding about that in. Uh, Genesis chapter 29, verse 13 to 21. And I would like somebody to read it for me. Genesis chapter 29. Nobody? I will call names. Um, yeah, okay, well, Adedayo, can you please? Uh, 
Can you please uh, read Genesis chapter 29, verse 13 to 21? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I read 13 to 21, Genesis 29. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And dear Jacob told him all these things. Then Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I will work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Hmm. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to some another man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Verse 21 and the last verse. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. My time is completed. I want to make love to her. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the last verse, it, is, uh, it says it very clearly. He wants to make love to her. In other words, he wants to uh, yeah, have sex with her. Uh, but when we read that chapter further, um, you know, I mean, actually, in tra in, uh, it's, it's actually in the tradition of, uh, of Laban that, um, that the oldest daughter uh, needs to marry first before the youngest daughter. So, um, so uh, Laban told Jacob that, uh, that he should first marry Leah. But because Jacob loved Rachel so much, he was even willing to work seven years more to have her. So in total, he, he worked 14 years for Rachel. So um, that means that he truly loved Rachel and um, he already had like a strong emotional bonding with her before getting married to her, before sharing bed with her. But uh, the last sentence, he said that Hello, I John. want Martha Snow, get away. Um, he said that, um, he said that, um, I'm coming, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So um, Jacob, he uh, yeah, he loved her so much. So and the last sentence actually said that he wants to make love with his wife. So it clearly says that in order for him to actually recognize Rachel as his wife, he needs to also have sex with her. So that also makes sex something very important. And like I said, sex is a consummation of your vow towards your spouse.
um yeah well um like i earlier said uh god god says actually to us that hey as as the um, man leaves his parents house he becomes one flesh with his wife sex also symbolizes the union between the three persons like god the holy spirit and jesus christ and also the relationship between jesus between jesus christ and the church so um i will explain it so the union between the three per, i mean the tri the trinity in marriage you know sex actually is the most intensive experience in human communion and in marriage like i said the two they become one body one flesh the union between the trinity you know is clearly um it's it's clearly expressed in how jesus christ talks about his father um i would like us to go to 2 corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 uh, I would like Abby to read it for us. Abby, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you yes. read the back passage? Please, can you read Second Book of Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 14? Okay. Um, it says, "May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all." Is it second or first? It is the second. Okay, yeah, that's yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have you ever questioned yourself why we actually pray this prayer like this? I think, like when I read this, I, when I read this uh, first. I was thinking hmm, there is a connection between the three and it says it actually very clearly you know like the fellowship of the holy spirit cannot happen without the love of god first so first god loves us so much and without the love of god we would have never been able to receive the grace of jesus christ so first the love of God, then the grace of Jesus Christ, and then we can have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. These three, they work together. We can also read that in uh, the book of John. Uh, Jesus Christ said that he cannot do without his father. And every single thing that his father tells him to do, that is the only thing that he does. So in that way, he understood his father really much. He understood the will of his father and he was like-minded as his father. I would also like us to read the book of John, um, John chapter 14, verse 26. And I would like Ben to read it for us. Ben, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, please. Can you uh, read? Was that John 14? Yes, John 14, verse 26. Thank you. says but the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that i said to you thank you very much so what jesus christ actually says here is that the helper which is the holy spirit is also called our advocate it's also called our strengthener. It's also called our helper. And the same thing that the Holy Spirit uh, does, also Jesus Christ did that in flesh, you know, like 
when he was there in a bodily form of his father towards his uh, disciples. So the Holy Spirit represents Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ represented his father. So in that way, they work together to achieve the same goal. And that's also what is seen in a marriage bond. In a marriage, you know, the union is seen in the way the husband and the wife talk, in the way the husband and wife also share their money, in the way the husband and the wife also take care of the children. In that way, they become like-minded in every single thing. And that's also what the Trinity has, that kind of union. Otherwise, they wouldn't have ever, um, they wouldn't have ever reached that goal of being able to save humanity. I also want to say that, you know, in union, you know, like the husband and the wife, they make room for each other. And in that way, they can grow. So that's the same thing that the Holy Spirit, the Father, and also Jesus Christ did towards each other. They made room for each other so that they can flourish. You know, another, um, you know, another way marriage symbolizes, uh, is also symbolized in the church, um, is um, seen in the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. And I want uh, Enoch to read Ephesians chapter five for us. Enoch? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 28. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 28. Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, if not Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 25. Husbands love the wife, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself to it, that they might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And verse 28. So ought men to love the wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. So we can see it, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, yes, this chapter actually um, states clearly that uh, the wife needs to subject herself to her husband. And the same way the church subjects itself to Jesus Christ. The husband is made the leader of the house. If subjection of the wife towards her husband is not happening, or if she doesn't do that, what happens, the house will collapse. The same thing with the church. The church needs to subject itself to Jesus Christ. And in that way, the church can flourish. So that is actually what uh, marriage symbolizes. It symbolizes the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. So now that we have understood also the importance of sex and uh, the marriage itself, I would like us to look at sexual vices, which is also called sexual sins or sexual immoral behaviors. So um, in the Bible, uh, the sexual sins uh, that are described um, or mostly described is, for example, adultery. And adultery is voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and someone other than his or her spouse. And fornication means sexual sin between unmarried couples. But there are also other contrary sexual behaviors, uh, for example, homosexuality, which is most prevalent in the world right now, but also incest, which is sexuality between family members, pedophilia, 
is perverted sexual attraction towards children and bestiality. This is a sexual affair with animals, rape, and that is a forceful intercourse with an unwilling partner. So rape can also happen in marriage because we are talking about a sexual intercourse with an unwilling partner. Pornography, which is physical images with a lustful intent. So this may be a display of materials or erotic videos, graphics, um, all these things can be addictive and also destructive, um, but also masturbation, and that's a use and use of sexual toys. Um, but there's also cyber sex, um, that is, um, yeah, true phone or sex orientated messages or conversations over the internet or communication devices out of sexual content. I want to actually um yeah pain into incest um you might uh think yeah but why did god allow family members uh, to have a sexual relation in the bible um now looking actually at uh, genesis uh, it was god's original plan uh, that he made male and female and like it didn't first make only the family of the male and then the family of the female. And then he said, yeah, have sex or relationship with each other. No, he created the male separately and the female separately. That was God's original plan. But um, before the law of Moses came, you know, there was no law. So many people, they did uh, things out of their own understanding. When the law of Moses came, which is written in Leviticus, then God said that there shouldn't, you, sh you shouldn't show your nakedness towards your own family member. So the father shouldn't show his nakedness to his, towards his daughter. Auntie shouldn't uh, show her nakedness towards her um, cousin, nobody sh in the family should sh uh, share its other's nakedness. So from that moment, it was detestable and something that God didn't like. But also scientifically speaking, it, um, it may lead to also harmful genetic condition when you uh, have sexual intercourse with your family members. So it is definitely not something, uh, something good. Um, but now we are going to the consequences of uh, sexual sin. Um, since it, sin itself, it brings condemnation. Uh, sin itself, it brings guilt, but also shame. Definitely, there are so many girls who, um, you know, who have experienced rape. And, um, you know, those girls are actually like the victims of that. Uh, there are also guys who have experienced that and you bring shame but also guilt upon them which is so destructive and next to that um also masturbation and um bone sex you know and all those things you know with 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 a partner outside your marriage is something that's also so destructive because it may lead to that force and the bible says that the only reason for you to file for divorce is when there is a sexual intercourse, you know, that which happens, I mean, it, when sexual intercourse has happened, because then you break actually the contract or an oath, let me put it that way, that you first had with your own wife. Um, but proverbs, uh, 6 verse 32 also says that um, a person who commits adultery, that person lacks understanding. You know, that person, if you, if you, if you commit sexual sin or do anything with a sexual sin, let me put it away, like you won't be able to think in a normal way because your mind is so occupied by it. 
and um and in that way um yeah it grieves also the holy spirit and you won't be able to really perceive what god tells you to do so um yeah that is that that are also the consequences but now the question how can we guard uh, ourselves against such sexual sins um it is uh first i want to read uh first corinthians chapter 6 verse 13 to 20 and i would like ezigo to read it for uh, us first corinthians what again chapter 6 verse 13 to 20. okay um um, meats for the belly and belly for meats, but God shall destroy it both and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God had both raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by his own power. 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that which he which is joined to an harlot is one? body for two shall he shall be one flesh 17 but he that is joined unto the lord is one spirit flee fornication every sin that a man doeth is without the body but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body um to 20 yeah yes okay what know you know that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which you have of god and you are not your own for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Thank you very much. So um, this uh, chapter of Corinthians clearly tells us that um, we are not our own. We have to understand that. We are not our own. Our bodies, we have been bought and paid with a high price, which is the death of Jesus Christ. And next to that, we have a Holy Spirit living within us. And that Holy Spirit, it makes us pure before God. And we shouldn't defile ourselves by um you know committing all these sins also the ultimate place where we i mean if we have lived the way that god wants us to live want to go is heaven so if we um don't live according to what god how god wants us to live we can eventually miss our destination um, but how we can guard ourselves or how we can flee from it, um, it is um, written in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. And I would like Emma to read it for us. Emma John, Romans chapter 12. Ima, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Romans Thanks. chapter 12, verse what? Verse 1 and 2. Okay, so it says, I beseech, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you very much. So um, the Amplified Version actually says that we need to dedicate all of ourselves to God. And dedication of all ourselves means our will, our mind, our emotions, every single thing, you know, 
And we need to subject ourselves to the will of God. So it is actually an unconscious decision that we have to make. And it is something that we consciously have to do every single time. So you will never, um, our choice will actually never, um, you know, end just one day or one time. It's every single time conscious decision because we have blood running in, I mean, within us, we are human beings, we can sin, but God Almighty gives us a remedy. God Almighty, God Almighty tells us that we need to dedicate all of ourselves to him. Um, um, yeah, so in Philippians chapter four, it also clearly tells us that um, we need to renew our way of thinking. We need to renew our way of thinking as well, in the sense that we need to think about things that are holy, that are um, noble, that are full of praise. You know, all those things are also uh, the things that reflects the way Jesus Christ thinks. So simply, it simply says actually that the way Jesus Christ thinks, we ought to think like that as well. And in that way, we can walk in the spirit. And the books of, um, um, the books of, uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, you know, and John, it really helps us and shapes us also in the way uh, Jesus Christ thinks and how he moved and walked, you know, during the time when he lived. So, um, yeah, when you read those uh, Gospels, it really helps us to, um, you know, to really see how Jesus Christ was and uh, how he thinks or um, what kind of behavior he expressed. And in that way, we also should walk. Um, so to summarize everything that I said, um, we discussed about sex, why it is important between husband and wife. And, um, and the reason why is because God made male and female after his image. And he also said, produce, multiply. That is one of the reasons also to have sex. But also it, it is because of physical union between the husband and the wife is very important. And we also dis discussed why sex is restricted in marriage. You know, it's really because of, you know, um, it's really because of, uh, of, 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 of how God wants us, how God wants it actually between husband and wife. And we also discussed, um, yeah, what sex really means, which is becoming one flesh, but also the symbol of it, which is, um, you know, the union between the persons of the Trinity and the relationship between Christ and the church. So, and also we discussed this, the consequences of sins and how to overcome it. Um, yeah, are there any questions? <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yes. Um, based on what you talked about, about first, thank you for the for the message for the teaching. Mm -hmm. um, concerning the things you talk about incest, I just wanted to know whether um, is this a scenario? You have like uh, brother A, you have A and B. They are a couple. A and B are a couple. Man A and uh, and wife B are a couple. The brother of man A and the sister of wife B, they are in laws and want to marry. Is that considered incest? The brother of A, A and the sister of B and the wife and the sister of wife B want to marry. So basically, um, the ones that want to marry are in laws of each other. Would that be considered incest? No. I don't, I don't think, no, 
I don't think so. Because incest means actually blood related. For an example, brother and sister. Hmm. Oh, before I say something, wrong. Thank you, Lord. please let uh, Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Okay. good question. Uh, praise the Lord. Can you hear me? Or? Hello, yes, okay. Yes. Um, well, we, we must know that um, we are African, right? Yes, and if we look at the in depth of that word, it is not. But we would also look at our culture, our tradition, and where we're coming from. And where we're coming from simply means that once you're married, the in-laws becomes family. Okay? So that way, um, morally, it doesn't look right for you to want to, for two in-laws to want to get married to each other. But when you look at the definition of that word, it is not wrong. Because these are two families that have come together and, you know, they are not blood related. Because when we talk about things, that has to do with blood relations and, you know, and all that. But looking at where we're coming from, our tradition and culture, the moment two people are married, the family becomes automatically, um, um, the two families become one. And so doing, it is morally wrong to say that, okay, two in-laws, you know, want to get married, like, okay, um, I'm, let, let me use myself, for example, so we understand. My brother want to marry my wife's sister, or my wife's sister. Now, it becomes morally wrong because there is a marriage in the family that has brought those families together and that have made them kind of family, okay? But when we look at the definition, it is not, because they are not um, blood related, okay? But being who we are and tradition and morals and all that, it, it, it makes it you know, kind of wrong. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, hello. Yeah? Uh, I have like a... <laughs> A question. No, this this has been bugging me for a while because uh, I've been checking this thing out. Uh, I was reading Genesis and then just uh, found out that Sarah was actually Abraham's sister. So <laughs> I was wondering, that is incest, no? And yeah, and he wanted his son to also marry from. So technically, his son, which is Isaac, got married to uh, uh, Rebecca. Which is actually also like his uh, his cousin, Isaac's cousin. Mm -hmm. Isaac got married to his cousin, and it went on with uh, Isaac's uh, sons. One of his son got married to his cousin again, another of his distant cousins. So it's like uh, that is like incest, 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 incest. So what's up with that? I just really want to know, clarify. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, basically, I believe uh, Abraham was before the before Moses' time. No, not really. No. <laughs> yes, he is. He is from Mo before Moses' time, before but Moses it doesn't time. mean that there were not people there. Yeah. So before Moses' time, there was no law of. Uh, there was no law of, of, of uh, you know, that you shouldn't marry uh, your, your family or blood-related family. So, yeah, God allowed it to happen. So in that way, yeah, incest happened. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, could, I, could I say something quickly? Yeah. Let's not so if we let's not go as far as Abraham and his sister and all the other examples. Mm -hmm. Let's go all the way to the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve mm -hmm. gave birth, yeah, to, you know, Cain and Abel. Cain 
um, exactly. killed Abel, and then the Bible then says, and then Cain um, went into <laughs> went into his wife. The Bible doesn't explain his where where his wife came from, but the Bible mm-hmm. when the Bible goes goes through the genealogy, it says that Adam gave birth to um, sons and daughters. So sons and daughters. Only, we can only assume that um, that Cain mm. either married married to um, his sister or his his niece. So this is mm. something that um, uh, you know has been happening since the time of Cain, not even all the way mm-hmm. you know, down along to Abraham and Sarah. The Bible says that you yeah. know, the Lord wants um, wants the Lord does encourage marriage. He wants us to be fruitful, be fruitful and to multiply. So Cain, if he didn't marry um, his sister, then he wouldn't have been able to marry a human being. So he had to marry his mm. sister. The only thing I'm going to say about your question is that at, I feel that at some point in time, uh, marrying your sister was permitted because God didn't expressly prohibit it until mm. the time of Moses about, and they estimate that that was about 2,500 years after creation and God prohibiting mm-hmm. the marriage of close relatives that was um, recorded in um, Leviticus 18.6 um, and the, the only thing, the, so that's what I'll mention that I don't, I think that you know, in God's plan um, God, God, when God made human beings um we were, you know, we were perfect, and, and that goes all the way down to um, our genetics and things like that. And when sin was introduced into the world, it touched absolutely everything. That included our genetics. Medically, one of the main reasons why it is it's horrible for relatives to marry each other is because people have, you know, special genetics that can cause um, diseases. But usually, these diseases are only caused when these the genes pile up so a person might have a gene but because they have it in such a small quantity it doesn't actually end up causing the disease but what Mm. now happens is that when you get somebody that um you know that when you start when you marry a relative or your relative you have a small portion of that of that gene your relative also has a small portion of that gene you now combine that together and you make a child who now has a larger portion of that gene and then start getting very, very horrible diseases. I can't even begin to mention a lot of them. A lot of them don't have any, they can't do anything for themselves. They are bedridden. They, they, they are, it's just very horrible. They, they, they can't, they can't um, follow their own saliva up to that level of, you know, horrible diseases. So I do believe that that's why, that's one of the reasons why God introduced that law in his infinite mercy to prevent those things from happening. But if you look into history, it wasn't introduced um, until about 2,500 years after creation. And, be, and that was because when God first created creation, we were perfect, and that was how he intended it. And when things started changing things, you know, um, God set out laws for our own benefit. So that's my sort of understanding of of that and another uh, and another very sh- short reason why um why like Cain couldn't have married anybody else but his sister is because the bible says that sin came through one man which is adam right sin, sin, sin came through one, one man which is adam we're all descendants of um of adam and and that's why you know christ dying for us um covers all of us because we came through Adam and so that means we inherited sin from Adam. If Cain married anybody else that was not from Adam, that means it's a separate set of human beings. Does that make sense? They have a different descendant that is not Adam, which would mean that Christ, Christ's sacrifice on the cross doesn't cover them because they are not coming from Adam. So we all come from Adam, meaning that Cain definitely married a relative, his sister or his niece. Okay, um, praise the Lord. Um, I would want to add um, a little to what um, Maya Kun has said. 
Okay, we must know that uh, why the law of Moses came to also stop the marriage of relations is because it was not the original plan of God. So we wouldn't say God created Adam and Eve and um, what God was intending to do was let them just give us and, you know, the start was plan. That was not the original um, plan of God. And I want to believe that part of the original plan of God is probably maybe since he has created Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve would be able to create another um, generation. I, I want to believe so. But um, when you look at the scripture, the cost of bearing children came upon Eve after the sin had been committed. So the Lord said, you will bear, you know, you will, you will bear a child who came and the labor and all that, and the man has to go to labor and all that, you know. Now, that simply means for them to um, replenish the earth and multiply, there was no longer um, God covering on, on them, on that aspect. So they have to go through that process, you know, to give birth to Cain and Abel, then Cain and Abel had to go, you know, go through that process. So when the law of Moses came, it was to correct that error that had happened that was not in the original plan. So the original plan, nobody knows what God would have done if that sin was not committed, how the earth would have been replenished and multiplied. And those are the things that all of us should make sure we get to heaven so that we can ask this sensitive question to God himself, who is the creator, to, to explain to us. So when the law of Moses came, you know, it corrected it. But the law of Moses was like too hard. And that was why when Jesus came, Jesus Christ came not to abolish the law, but to, you know, correct most part of the law that was being misunderstood. And that was where even the divorce law was corrected. Because I, I, I heard you make mention of the divorce law. So when Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ abolished that law. From his statement and the way Jesus Christ abolished that law is when Jesus Christ said uh, that uh, uh, women be submissive and men love your wife right now if you look at that content of those statement that Jesus Christ made automatically abolish anything that has to do with um, adultery um, fornication you know that gives you reason to divorce now the, the how that became it. When you look at what Christ meant by men, love your wife as Christ loved the church, then go on, on this, go and find out how did Christ love the church. Then if you can understand how Christ loved the church, then you know that there is more responsibility to you to be able to want, bear, tolerate, and in every circumstance forgive. Because that was the love Christ had for church, for the church, that he went to the cross to die for the church. Okay, so Christ coming, you know, corrected most of the laws that was uh, interpreted. So, like I said, I think all of us need to make heaven so that we can ask, you know, Christ himself some of these technical questions. But I, I, from my understanding, can tell you in the beginning, you know, it was never in the plan of God to have even anything that has to do with, you know, blood division, sleeping with each other. So the error of man was what brought that in, and that was why, you know, the law has to correct it, and when Jesus Christ came, he gave a perfect correction to it. Thank you very much for your explanation. Um, are there any other questions? I have another question, please. Okay. It's about adultery, like um, Brother Jude was talking about how um, Jesus came and fulfilled the law and everything. In Matthew 5, 27, Jesus was talking about, it is said that that shall not commit adultery, but then he said something strange, saying that whosoever look at on the woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now my question is that, uh, does that mean that the person that is not married looks lost after a woman and the woman also is not married? How can that be adultery? Because she said adultery means that you are from a marriage 
from a marriage standpoint, you you have sex outside marriage. So if two people are unmarried and they lost after each other, how is that then committed adultery in the heart? I, I don't understand why Jesus used that expression. Okay, um, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. Um, now, what is the definition of adultery? To marry people, that adultery has to do with um, to marry people. Now, between two people, there could be two two forms of sexual sin. It could be adultery and fornication. So, if a single brother is sleeping with a married woman, the single brother is committing fornication, and the married woman is committing adultery. Okay, so if two single sisters are sleeping together, both of them are committing fornication. Okay, so adultery comes in when? Can we hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. adultery comes in when the marriage is committing a sexual sin. So a married woman sleeping with a married man, adultery. A married woman sleeping with a single brother to commit ad adultery, the single brother is committing fornication. Okay, so when Jesus Christ made that statement, one of the things you should look at is what was the event that brought out that statement. So if a single brother, if if a single brother, you know. Um, get lost in his mind and you know, saw his sister and get lost. The brother has just committed fornication. Then, if um, it is a married man, lusting over a married woman, he has just committed adultery. Do, do you understand? Uh, okay. That statement was made. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. yeah, thank you very much, Brother Jude. That question is actually a very technical question. And as you were speaking, I had to go into the interlinear Bible, the Greek, the original Greek Bible, to read that particular passage in, in the Greek dictionary. Now, I think what actually happened here is in that statement, if you read it from the... Um, Verse 28, it says, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her, for her has already committed adultery in, with her in his heart. Well, if we do a very simple study I've just done right now. Now, the, the, the Greek word that is translated for woman in that particular Bible text it strongly is also used to refer to a wife. So, for example, that particular word has been translated 221 times, and 92 of the times, it also refers mostly to a wife. So, in that context, Jesus was given an example. So, basically, you can almost say that what Jesus was Referring to in that context that whoever looks at another man's wife, because that word woman there is used interchangeably. It has also been used 92 times in the Bible to refer to a wife. You, you, so, so you now get why the other statement that comes with it has to be adultery. Okay, so it's just to be honest, it's just a matter of greek grammar here but and also don't forget that many times in scriptures things are often spoken symbolically so basically the conclusion is that that word woman there is mostly also used 92 times also translated as wife so it's an open it's a matter of translation and that was why the next thing that came with it was adultery because basically it's talking about looking at another man's wife, okay? That commit, that, 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 that's why the, the next verse there was actually using adultery. But obviously you as well know 
that you can also apply this to other contexts, right? <laughs> if you are looking at an animal lustfully in your heart, you have already committed bestiality. Obviously, you can extend that to other issues because Jesus Christ was trying to drive to the point that these sins begin in the heart. That, that's what is called iniquity. Iniquity starts in the heart. So I hope I've been able to give a small basic thing from just the little research I've just done now. Thank you. Yes, thank well, you. I hope I get, I made the point. I don't know. Yeah, thank, you, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I say something? Um, uh, yes, please. Um, but you will be the last uh, person then. Okay, we thank, have to you for, thank you for the contributions. Um, it's been amazing. Um, in reference to Solomon's question, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Mayo Kung and um, Brother Jude said. Um, I also believe another reason why God permitted um, that sort of marrying from your family then was another reason I believe why God permitted it was because then if we looked at if we look at the the uh, what they call it if we look at the the people of like that's the other family the other people that's not the family of abraham um the bible makes us to know that they were unbelievers so god did not want isaac's and um, he didn't want abraham's generation to get mixed with unbelievers i don't know if we we understand so that's why he did not want because of course we know God doesn't want us. To, he doesn't want. Uh, um, he doesn't want us to have anything to do with unbelievers because he said um, we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So I just believe another reason was because he didn't want Isaac and Abraham's generation to get married to unbelievers. Praise God. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the time has passed, friends. And uh, we have to round up, but I want to, um, I I want to uh, give uh, Sister Shamim like uh, space right now, because I understood she wants to share information with us. Yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. Shamim is not around now, so I will just take the announcement for okay. everyone. Um, thanks so much, Miriam, for that wonderful uh, teaching. Uh, God bless everyone who has contributed. So we have a major program coming up from the 15th to the 17th of June. It's a prayer conference with the team, The Blessed. Um, we'll be meeting on Monday. So that's next week, Monday, next week, Tuesday, and next week, Wednesday. The information and everything we posted on the group but we want everyone to already start anticipating um, towards the event, share the flyers, and try to be a part of it. I pray God will bless us all. And then another important information is during this event, for each day we'll be having um, one of our SAT goals, uh, our regional pastors joining us. So the three of them, our AGO, the SAT goal, and um, the SAT goal for Region 2, and also the SAT goal for Region 3. So it's actually a loaded program then we're also going to be having our mean stress jude as well being a part of that also ada and um, our very own go case so i want all of us to anticipate and please once you see the flyer let's try to um, share it and post it on as many social platforms as we can god will bless us all as we do that in jesus name amen so miriam you can run the for us then amen thank you very much for the information Okay, let us um, have our closing prayer. In the name of Jesus, Father Lord, we thank you that you have been here this evening with us. Father Lord, we thank you that we have gained more understanding of the questions we have. Father Lord, help us to grow more in understanding about this topic as well. And Father in heaven, I pray, Father God, to guide us in any areas of our lives as we grow in you. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being your children, our Lord. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. I thank you for all coming. Have a blessed uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Have a Bye. blessed evening. Bye-bye.